Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 4 of the Nerd Federation Podcast. I am your host, Will Hernandez. Welcome to another week of video game and pro wrestling talk. This is a pro wrestling and video game podcast. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, (laughs) is there a lot and a lot to discuss this week. You know, first, before I kind of get into the monologue this week, there are a couple of things I want to say just about the podcast in general as now I'm going into episode number four and again trying to build some momentum. But I have to realize that I need to pimp out the podcast so to speak. So, socials. I am on X, Twitter. Look for the Nerd Federation Podcast. I'm going to put all these links in the description. I am now also on Instagram. I did that today. That is at Nerd Federation Podcast. I am also on TikTok at Nerd, the Nerd Federation Podcast. And... You can listen to the podcast on YouTube. Just look for the Nerd Federation podcast. I'm going to put all these links in the description so that they're there and so that they're there every week because I'm noticing when I see the podcast come up on these networks that shit, I'm forgetting two things. I'm forgetting socials and I'm forgetting to put timestamps. And I thought I had the timestamp thing figured out because the platform that I use, BuzzFeed, Buzzsprout, geez, BuzzFeed, good Lord, Buzzsprout offers this like AI type of thing that it's supposed to go through your podcast and try to find the areas where they think they can do timestamps. They kind of quote unquote listen to the audio, and do their AI magic. Let me tell you something right now. The technology (laughs) is not there yet, okay? Definitely not. As great as I think AI can be, and generative AI, I mean, it's something that I deal with. Not really deal with, but it's a topic that comes up throughout the course of my job as a media strategies for public relations for fintechs. It's a hot topic, but there are certain things that it can't do yet. And whatever, machine learning as well. We still have a ways to go and Buzzsprout needs to better train their system. And it gets better over time, but it's better that I manually put in these timestamps. So you're going to hear me today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be writing down timestamps as we go along because I think it's important to have those on because I think it helps people kind of find what they want to find in the podcast. And hopefully that is going to lead to more engagement with the podcast because quite frankly, not a lot of people are listening to this <laughs> and I just haven't found my lane yet. Hopefully... Hopefully, I can get to a point where I start doing interviews. I, I I do want to do that, but I promised myself I was going to get through 10 episodes first and then kind of go from there. So it is, we're two weeks out, less than two weeks out from Christmas when I'm recording this. The date today is, I record on the Tuesdays, Tuesday nights, it's December 12th. We're almost there. We're almost to, to Christmas time. So just a bit of housekeeping for that week. Probably going to record an episode in advance that week because I'm likely, and let's get into it, I'm likely going to the Madison Square Garden house show now because your one and only man, CM Punk, is going to be having his first WWE match in nine years, and it's going to happen at fucking Madison Square Garden. Unbelievable. Tickets are still available. I was checking today. They're a little pricey because you pay that garden premium. I think the most I saw, you're basically paying with fees and taxes about 60 bucks a ticket, and you're sitting up in the nosebleeds. But 
you know what? I've been to MSG so many times for WWE events over the years that it doesn't matter, really. You're kind of there for the atmosphere. And I have not been, I'm trying to think, I have not been to a WWE house show or show of any kind. I think it was in January of 2022. I went to a house show in Boston. This is when they were just finally getting back on the road and doing shows. So it was sparse attendance at the TD Garden there in Boston, in the north end of Boston. And uh, yeah, you know, it was cool. It was cool to kind of be in that atmosphere again after so long. I had been to Revolution uh, just previously. I think it, I think I, I'm trying to think how that worked out. Revolution was in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. That was when AEW was starting to put back on shows and doing it at Daly's place. But anyway, it was uh, it was interesting <laughs> to say the least to be in an atmosphere. So let let's talk about to start the show here and talk about CM Punk. Because, and this is going to be the monologue for this week, for this first section. Because he's now, we know he's going to be on Raw now, right? But he was making the rounds, uh, as only CM Punk can do. And this whole mini storyline about what brand is CM Punk going to pick. It's an easy story, right? Simple, he's back. Where's he going to show up? So he's making the rounds, SmackDown, NXT. He was at NXT, the NXT show on Saturday, which, by the way, I completely forgot about what's happening over the weekend. I haven't watched any wrestling over the weekend. I'm going to get that out of the way. But you see enough clips. And obviously, you don't get a true sense of things watching clips. But you see the things that I'm happening that, that are happening as I'm screaming into the microphone right now. Apologies as I step back a little bit from the microphone. But he shows up on SmackDown this past Friday and gives this promo. And I saw the promo. I saw, I watched a clip on YouTube because somebody told me to go watch it. So I watched it. And here, here was the issue. And... and Oof, there there are a lot of different ways you can take this you can take this whole whole thing um because they were recording it was kind of the the tribute to the troops episode so you weren't necessarily going to have the normal kind of crowd at that show so punk makes reference he makes an AEW reference. He makes a reference to the situation with Jack Perry at All In in London. Okay? And it really fell flat with that audience despite obviously it being a hit with the 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 IWC, the hardcore people like like me. <laughs> Let's not get crazy with that IWC shit because y'all motherfuckers have a lot of problems. Anyway, so, of course, as is the case with a lot of these things, a conversation starts happening on social media about why that whole thing fell flat on Friday night. Why there wasn't a reaction from the crowd when he made that veiled reference to the Jack Perry situation. So... One of the things, one of the problems is that that wasn't necessarily the crowd to do that promo in front of. And I know that's it's kind of a silly thing to say in some respect because, listen, you have to have him going around to these different shows to kind of tease him going to whatever, whichever brand that, that's out there. So you got to deal with the cards that you're, you know, play with the cards that you're dealt in, in in that sense. So, but the narrative that was online what was a few things that I saw about how, A, 
the reason why there was no reaction to that shot was because that's just not the right crowd, right crowd to do it in front of because it was a tribute to the troops crowd. That was one thing. That was A. B, AEW was not mainstream. So not a lot of people know what he was talking about. Three, the WWE audience is not the AEW audience and vice versa. So those were kind of the three things that were kind of happening the nar- at least the narratives that I saw online after that promo hit. So I already talked about A. Let's talk about B. About AEW. I feel like it always comes back to AEW. And, and there's a reason for it. I, I think the issue is that people are not looking as AEW as the alternative. It's supposed to be the alternative. Even Bubba Ray, I think it was last late last week, he was on Busted Open Radio and said how he had to put on a different pair of glasses or a different set of eyes when he's watching AEW programming because it's the alternative to WWE. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's the problem. Why can't we just let that be? Personally, I don't want AEW to be WWE light. Okay? I don't want that. And I know that gets thrown a lot around a lot. Along with the TNA 2.0. Insult. The problem, too, is that AEW does come off as WWE light in some ways. But I think they're recognizing that they need to be different. You don't need to be better than. You need to be different than. And by the way, that is stolen from Eric Bischoff because Bischoff tells the story. About how when Ted Turner came to him to start Nitro, Bischoff was like, what the fuck am I going to do? He knew he couldn't be better than WWE. Okay? He knew he couldn't be bigger at that point than WWE or WWF at the time. But he could be different than WWF at the time. And that was the big difference. And that's why WCW picked up momentum. And there you go with the 83 Weeks narrative, which, by the way, is the name of Bischoff's podcast, 83 Weeks. How was it different? We know. The the people who watched back then know the Cruiserweight division, right? Usually starting off the night with one of those matches. And by God, they have great cruiserweights back then. The Rey Mysterios and Eddie Guerreros and the Dean Malencos and the Jerichos and the Chris Benoit's. That was one way they did it. Two was just the real life blurring of the lines with the storyline, obviously, of the NWO. I mean, period, end of story right there. The way they shot things. Because Bischoff always says. It was really WCW that started this whole thing about doing the stuff backstage. Because that wasn't really being done before. It was very rare. Outside of the interviews that you saw backstage. But WCW introduced this other element. Now. Eventually people thought that was better than. But. It was different then. And that's what AEW needs to just keep doing. They're doing that right now. They're doing that with the Continental Classic, which is going over huge. It's just fucking wrestling. But they are weaving in storylines. It was funny because when I saw my brother this past weekend, 
He's he goes hot and cold on AEW. He is very, very critical of AEW. He watches it every week, though. He's watching Dynamite and he's watching Rampage. We're sitting there because we went to a St. John's game on Sunday. And he looks over at me and goes, I really cannot wait for that Moxley Strickland match. And I was like, yes, absolutely. People are, the people who are consistently watching Dynamite and AEW programming are looking forward to that match. And it's probably going to main event tomorrow night. As I'm recording this. And Tony Khan earlier today announced that they have a run over of five minutes for the show this week. So something might maybe happen. I don't know. We'll see. But I have to imagine that that match is going to main event. And people are looking forward to that. We could get a draw. I hope not. I hope Strickland goes over. Maybe he uses this nefarious means to, to win on Wednesday. On tomorrow night as I'm recording this. But that's the thing. AEW needs to worry about AEW. And not worry about WWE. Because WWE is an establishment. It's a worldwide establishment. It's going to take a long time to even begin to crack that nut. AEW doesn't have the global deals that WWE has. It's getting bigger in in foreign markets. I mean, look what look at what they do. Look at what they did in London this past year, and they're gonna do it again next year. And apparently, ticket sales are going are going pretty well. Again, AEW needs to worry about AEW. And I know, listen, I'm not going to even say I know. The narrative from the quote-unquote dirt sheets suggests that people are not crazy about the ticket sales at some of these events and the empty arenas. Listen, I think that might be a, a big negative for Tony Khan the past couple of years in that you should have stayed with the smaller venues. Because I would rather have a packed six, 7,000 seat venue than try to do the Bell Center in Montreal that holds, that held 17,000 for WWE. Smaller, smaller. There's nothing wrong with smaller. And then you do a big show every once in a while and the demand is there like in LA and you sell the place out. It doesn't have to always be these big arenas. Small, small, small. Mid. <laughs> Some people think AEW is in it, but I digress. But that's what I wanted to say for the opener. Again, listen, AEW needs to worry about being AEW. WWE is going to do what WWE does. It's a fucking machine. It's a well-oiled machine. And there is room for alternatives in this day and age. And AEW is doing things... That others have not done. That have tried to do. Look what's going on with NWA. They're regulated to fucking YouTube. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. TNA. Impact's about to rebrand. But they're stuck on Axis. You're not getting a lot of people. A lot of eyeball balls on Axis. You're just not. AEW's number two. Right now. There's nothing wrong with that. Impact would kill to be number two. NWA would kill to be number two. New Japan would kill to be kill to be number two here in MLW. So number two is fine. It's fine. It is fine. And we need to have that separation between the two. Alright. That's gonna do it for the opening salvo here. On the Nerd Federation Podcast. We're in episode 4. I'm going to take a quick break. And come right back. And start talking about some more wrestling. Hey and welcome back. To episode number 4. Of the Nerd Federation Podcast. I am your host. 
Well, Hernandez, you know, it's funny when you're doing this. And I was thinking about this today and thinking that you can't always make this, these things sound smooth. This podcast sounds smooth. Try not to sound fake. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I learned a long time ago, like it took me a while to kind of get over the, you know what I'm saying thing. And, you know, it, that's difficult. Listen, it took me it took me a long time to train myself to really stop saying those things, those kind of hiccup things, those those yips, I guess, for lack of a better term. But it's it's hard. It's hard to keep that in mind when you're talking and to clean uh, to keep a clear flow of words as you are talking, but. And I'm not saying this to kind of shit on anybody else, but I listen to a lot of podcasts out there, very, very popular podcasts, and man, sometimes it's 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 hard to listen to because they're just not clear sometimes with expressing their thoughts and having a, I guess, coordinated train of thought. Without falling into saying, you know what I'm saying, or you know, or anything, anything like that. It's difficult. It's really difficult. And the only reason I was able to really rise above that was because when you're put on stage in front of people, you learn how to control that in your mind really quickly. And you learn to speak slowly. That's what it really comes down to. That's kind of the trick of this whole thing is to kind of speak slowly and to speak deliberately, deliberately (laughs) and think about what you're really going to say and kind of take your time. That's why you're going to hear me pause a lot when I'm recording this because I'm trying to gather my thoughts before I go forward and start talking again. I'm also going to be taking a pause to kind of take some water and write down the uh, the next timestamp, which is actually going to happen right now when talking about Seth Rollins. Because apparently, you know, this is the thing. I, 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 I want to say something about too quickly about just kind of internet, I, I guess, pro wrestling reporting as somebody... And this is somebody who was a journalist. I'm, I used to be a journalist, okay? I've mentioned that on this show before. I was a journalist for a very long time. It's how I, excuse me, as I adjust myself here in my chair. I was a journalist for a very long time. So the problem that I kind of see, and I think this whole Seth Rollins contract situation is is a good example to kind of use as a jumping point for a bit of a rant, but I honestly don't know what's true and what isn't (laughs) when it comes to what is reported out there by the likes of Dave Meltzer and uh, Sean Ross, is it? And uh, the guy from, uh, there are, (laughs) I'm sorry, shows you how much I pay attention to that. Because you kind of see the um, the aggregators out there tweeting a lot of stuff. So a lot of the news that I see is aggregated and based off of what these other people say. So, which is a problem because sometimes thinking, things can get lost in translation. But I don't know. The whole pro wrestling journalism thing is fucking weird to me. Because you are reporting on, well, I guess it's like any other entertainment genre, right? Because you have movie critics and you have outlets like Variety that report on the television industry and the movie industry. And then you have the mainstream media outlets that cover pro wrestling like Sports Illustrated and like ESPN, even though with ESPN it's a lot of WWE coverage, they don't they don't touch AEW. At least Sports Illustrated does both. 
or more than that. I forget what the guy's name is that's the main reporter over there, but he's supposedly uh, really, really good. So that that being said, with all that, I so when you hear this shit about Seth Rollins and his contract is supposedly expiring in 2024, you wonder, A, if that's true or not. I mean, it sounds plausible. Anytime you talk about somebody's contract expiring, I guess, I guess it's plausible. I guess it's reasonable to think that the contract is coming up. So I, I guess the question is now, what happens? <laughs> I, I can't imagine a scenario where WWE doesn't re-sign Seth Rollins. Because to me, that's just fucking crazy. That they would let that guy walk away and essentially join the quote-unquote competition. But then again, Seth Rollins might be at a point of his career where he might want to do something different. He's a great... Listen, I will say again and again... Seth Rollins might be the most underrated guy in that company and has been for a very, very long time. Seriously. He does everything well. I mean, there was that, there was that point, if you remember during that championship run, during his chicken shit heel, as they call him, his chicken shit heel run, after he won the title, when he cashed in the uh, the money in the bank in San Francisco against Brock Lesnar and, uh, excuse me, San Jose. <laughs> That's where that WrestleMania actually took place. When he cashed in that, that um, the money in the bank there and won, he had a pretty long reign. He had the whole storyline with J&J security and Kane and all that. And it was good. It was good. He did a good job. There were some people who didn't think his promos were great, but obviously that has changed. His promos have only gotten better over the years. And if you watched Raw on Monday, you saw that promo with Punk in the ring. So I, I can't, that's why I, it's like I can't imagine that guy leaving unless, unless again, that's his desire. Like his desire, his desire to leave. Look, let me tell you something. <laughs> I would love, 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 love to see Rollins. He would probably go by Tyler Black again in AEW. I would love to see him go up against Kenny Omega. Oof. Man. That would be fucking amazing to see those two go at it in the ring for 30 minutes. It'd be great. It'd be fucking... That would be great pro wrestling. Because those two, I think, are... Cons- I, I mean, I consider them two of the best in the world. If I had to make a list... If I had to make a list whew, right now... Oh, man. Mm. That's a tough one. If I had to make a top five list right now, I'd probably put Danielson, number one. Omega, number two. Okada, number three. Rollins would probably be number four. Number five could be a Ver- Oh, Will Ospreay. God, who the what? <laughs> Come on. That's an easy, I feel like that's an easy top five. Rollins is definitely up there. I mean, there's not even a there's not even a fucking question about that. And maybe even Balor. I've got a soft spot for Balor. And AJ Styles when he's healthy. Sip of water right there. 
But yeah, so you basically have a top five worldwide talent in a in oof, not AJ Styles in Seth Rollins. You think they're gonna let him walk out the door? Mm, I don't know about that. And don't forget his wife. <laughs> and I know they're not connected anymore in that way, just as far as like storyline wise. We know. Everybody knows. Everybody knows they're married. They had a storyline there for a hot minute, and that's gone now. Like, we know that. But Rollins is one of the faces of that company. And could there be a scenario where it looks like we're going to have Rollins versus Punk night one of WrestleMania? That's what we're building towards right now, right? And it's a long, slow build, which I like. And it's piquing my interest because it's long-term storytelling. And it's involving two of the best right now. So it's making me want to watch more WWE. And I will. Once we get into the Royal Rumble season, WrestleMania season, I'm going to be watching as much as possible. So we're, we're, we're heading towards that. Is, is there a scenario where... I mean, Punk wins at WrestleMania, wins that title, and then Rollins goes away? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. I mean, nobody really knows. First of all, nobody knows if this contract situation is real. Second of all, apparently it is. I don't know. Second of all, we don't know when it expires. Over the summer, maybe, which would make the most sense. I don't know. I, I gotta imagine. I have to imagine that uh, that Rollins does stay because I think it would be foolish on WWE's part to let him go. And I know, you know, he's a Triple H guy, right? Triple H has no problem having Rollins be the top guy on Raw. I also wonder where. Uh, I want to call him Punishment Martinez, <laughs> but that's not, that's not what his name is. Oh my God. What is his name? I'm going to do a little, uh, Damien Priest. <laughs> oh God. That was his old Ring of Honor name, Damien Priest. Why couldn't I remember that? Anyway. He still has a briefcase, right? So I wonder how that's going to all play out with everything. So anyway, that's kind of some chatter, some WWE chatter, chatter. So people can say that, you know, oh, all I talk about is AEW. But I am going to talk about AEW for the next two, the next two things here as I kind of go into my, uh, you know, timestamp thing here and kind of talk about. This whole situation that kind of blew up in the past few days with Mark Briscoe on Twitter. Where he was upset about... And this is going to play nicely into what I'm going to talk about to finish out the pro wrestling segment. And talking about uh, Final Battle on, on Friday and Ring of Honor and the situation. I don't know. Anyway... Go, go back to Mark Briscoe, who's going to be in the match on Friday, by the way, a trios match for to honor Jay Briscoe, obviously his, his brother that uh, tragically passed away uh, earlier this year. But, you know, he got upset that the WWE on Fox Twitter account put out a tweet with the, you know, it wasn't even a hashtag. It was just saying, dumb boys. Right. And it was of Lashley and, uh, you know, and, and his and his crew. I want to say private party. But that's not. Oh, my God. That's not that's not who they are. But you know who I'm talking about, you know. Uh, I'm going to get this right because I want to get it right. The Street Profits. Jesus Christ. I mean, Street Profits, private, I, listen, <laughs> there isn't much of a difference between the two in some ways. Anyway, so listen, he got 
he got mad. So he retweeted that and basically, and I have the tweet up here. He's like, for real, two question marks. This shit is hilarious. At Triple H, whoever runs this Twitter should probably be fired for lack of knowledge. Or they need the taste slapped out of their mouth for lack of reverence. And then there were other people, you know, Maria Canella said about it being tone death, you know. Uh, and, and then Mark Briscoe later came back and he said, you know, listen, he was, uh, this is what he said. He said, oh, yeah, that's why I quit posting on Twitter, LOL. Just log back on, dot, 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 wow. Some of y'all are wild, LOL. I just miss my brother, that's all. And I got a little of my feelings when I seen the Fox post. At Triple H, you ain't got to fire nobody. Times is tough. Love y'all. Take it. Oh, a kind of thing out here. I'm going right to the actual tweet. Take it light, people. And you know, and I'm you know, you look at the you look at the um the responses and and, and things like that and you know, some people were going after Mark Briscoe for that thing. And it's just like, how can you blame a guy for feeling a certain way seeing that phrase? And listen, he doesn't own the copyright to that one. And we know the Dallas Cowboys use them boys and all this other shit. And it's not something that belongs to Mark Briscoe or to Ring of Honor or or to his brother Jay. It, it this doesn't. But and this is the thing going back to what I said in the beginning about the CM Punk promo. If you are a certain segment of the pro wrestling audience like me, you are going to know that dumb boys is something that's associated with the Briscoe brothers. It just is. The Briscoes. It, it is. But to, it's not fair to expect somebody running the WWE on Fox account to know anything about Ring of Honor. Or know anything about the Briscoes or AEW. This is some corporate like. Flack probably running that Twitter account. I don't know. So, you know, Mark got in his feelings and he admitted it. And he apologized for, you know, feeling that way. Which, he, listen, you don't have to apologize. You shouldn't have to apologize for feeling the way you feel about a situation. Your brother died in a tragic car accident. Okay? That takes a while to get over. And then Mark is now finding a new way for himself as a singles competitor, which is great. You know, he's been in a Continental Classic, hasn't won, but obviously that's by design. He becomes this sympathetic figure, which is great. You kind of boost him up a little bit with that story. He's going to be in the trios match on Friday in a pretty marquee uh, matchup on Friday as I'm actually bringing up that card. Um, so, you know, it's some... Um, don't, you can't blame the guy. You can't blame the guy for feeling feeling the way he feels about, about the situation. And again, you see some people saying on, online, oh, you shouldn't apologize, you shouldn't apologize. I just think it's funny, the tribalism. The tribalism comes out with some shit like this because, you know, you've got the WWE fanboys coming out and saying, who? Like, who's that? Like, who's Mark Briscoe? Like, who's this guy? You know? And then you've got the AW slash Ring of Honor people, you know, kind of doing the same in 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 some respect. But the tribe, it's just funny how like tribalism comes out in these different ways. And it's just, it's it's really, it's a little sickening. It's a little sickening. So that's um it's a nice transition talking about about Mark Prisco because 
Coming up on Friday, as I'm making a note here, we've got Final Battle. And it's Ring of Honor's last pay-per-view of the year. And uh, this... So the first thing is that Final Battle is only available on Honor Club. So, you know, you can watch Ring of Honor, the year-end event, and I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the website now, for nothing more than the cost of the Honor Club subscription, which is how much? I think it's like $9.99 or something like that. Something, um, you know, it's, I think it's like 10 bucks, basically. Maybe a little cheaper than that. So for the cost of that, you're able to, you know, watch the the show. So I feel like that's an issue. <laughs> you know, like you're you're I feel like I'm almost getting tricked to to subscribe to this service just to watch the show, and then I'll forget. By the way, I am gonna watch the show because I'm gonna be tweeting along with it. I already warned my girlfriend about it, and I'm watching that show on Friday. But, again, so let me back up. This is what I'm talking about, like taking your time to talk. So this past week, Eric Bischoff made some headlines, as he usually does when he talks in this podcast, and they were talking about Ring of Honor and how he thought that it's you know, Tony Khan should put it out of his mid, put it out of its misery. Its time has come, you know, and they never really did anything great with it in in some ways. I don't know, and there's a lot to be said about that. But it's like this second brand that's possibly weighing down, that's weighing down AEW. I don't know. Somebody tried to make the argument that it's contributing to like lower ratings because people are like checked out. But I don't, I honestly don't think that that's the case. But it's weird because you're going to have this show. You're not going to have a Ring of Honor world title match because that belt is intertwined with the Continental Classic. So you're going to have a final battle without the Ring of Honor title being defended. So... That, in turn, you have Athena and Billy Starks headlining the pay-per-view, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that whole storyline's been the hottest thing that's been going on the whole year. So you might as well blow it off in a title match at Ring of Honor, at Final Battle. But I'm looking at the card now. There's only four, there's only four matches on the card. There's Athena and Billy Starks. For the for the women's title, you've got the Keith Lee versus Shane Taylor match, which is eh, I I, I don't know it. Uh, the way they've been building this this stuff up is just is just silly. I think in some ways. Then you've got Tony Nese versus Ethan Page. I don't want to say who cares, but I don't know. Then you've got this trios match between the Blackpool Combat Club and Mark Briscoe and FTR. Which is actually pretty cool. Because Brian Danielson's going to be back in Ring of Honor. A Ring of Honor brand in the ring for the first time in a very, very long time. And that's the match to like honor honor Jay Briscoe. TV title, I think that will be decided on Friday as well. Because they, they've been having a tournament for that. And I think Tony Khan today talked about the tag titles. And honestly, I didn't do, you know, research <laughs> on that, about the future. But then, I mean, where are the, you know, the six man? Oh, the six man, you can't do that because Agony, the Gates of Agony, they're in New Japan and they were part of the Tag League. So you weren't able to like build up something there with those with those titles. So it just kind of seems as, as though sometimes... Ring of Honor is it as is this albatross around Tony Khan's neck 
And Bischoff was making the argument that maybe Tony should not have bought Ring of Honor to begin with. And I get it. You get the tape library, which is probably value valuable. It has some value to it. But I do think, and I, I will say this until I'm blue in the fucking face. They need to separate the two and have a distinct separation between the brands. They do. I don't think you can have people just going back and forth nilly willy. And like all of a sudden you've got Keith Lee on this on this on the show and you've got the Blackpool Combat Club on the show. What does that tell you about what does that say about the other wrestlers that are involved here with Ring of Honor? Are you not building up new stars that you have to rely on, you know, basically five of the six guys in that trios match that are AEW stalwarts to be on this pay-per-view? Like, what are we doing? Why is this so intertwined with AEW? And I'm glad, like, I am so glad that they took the, the title, the TV title off Samoa Joe. I really am. He doesn't need it. And what, did he defend it like twice? <laughs> Two or three times? And those matches won AEW. So this, this is what I'm talking about. There needs to be a separation. And you need to have Tony not involved with Ring of Honor at all. As far as like running things. And I know there are other people. There's Jerry Lynn and... Uh, God, I forget his name. I forget his name. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. The guy who was with Big Bill at, at one point. The smaller, uh, short black gentleman. You guys know who I'm talking about. Those guys are supposedly kind of the bookers of the Ring of Honor. But I mean, how much, how much input does Tony Khan still have there? I mean, I'm not even watching Ring of Honor every week. And you hear bits and pieces there, here and there, because it, it kind of intertwines a bit with Ring of Honor, but make that shit separate. Make it a separate entity. I don't know if I necessarily agree that with Bischoff is that they should let it die. I don't think they should. But what's happening now is not the answer. So maybe at this point next year, there's a different story heading into final battle and there's a card that you could like legitimately be excited about because you've had good storylines. And they're also, they need to find an easier way to f- help watch Ring of Honor and not do this online stuff. Hopefully, Tony can get this, can get Ring of Honor a deal with the whole streaming with Max and, and, and all that. That would make it easier. That would make me watch Ring of Honor more. Because I love Ring of Honor. I, I've, I've said it last week or two weeks ago about the legacy that I have with Ring of Honor. Thanks to CM Punk. And kind of learning about him. So I really hope it doesn't go away. But I think they need to do something differently with it in 2024. And just really make it its own kind of uh, separate brand. So anyway... That's going to do it for the, as I'm moving my mouse here, the pro wrestling portion of the podcast. I'm going to come right back and talk video games. Going to talk about the Game Awards. My God, the Game Awards. And I'm going to talk about my end of year uh, reviews. And I beat Alan Wake Remastered. So I'm going to talk about all those things right after this. And welcome back to episode four of the Nerd Federation podcast with your host, Will Hernandez. I had somebody ask me last week, what do you do when you take the break? Do you actually take a break? I'm like, yeah, I take a break. I leave my office, stretch my legs, refill my water. I just had a little snack. To kind of refuel. I had dinner before I started recording. So that's all good. It's about 9 o'clock. 
at night on a Tuesday. We're almost there to winter. Christmas is soon. My shopping is not done. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it's uh, fun times. No, but I love this type of this time of the year. It's uh, my favorite time of the year, and you know, I, it's funny because I I've been running into and listening to a lot of like fucking Grinches for Christmas. I don't know. It just seems like I, I think something happened where kind of people lost the spirit of Christmas along the way. And I don't know if it's because people got older or just uh, commercial commercialism and capitalism that surrounds Christmas. And it, it can be overwhelming for people. But, man, I love this time, time of the year. You know? Love it. This It's, um... And I hate to say it. <sighs> I hate to say it. But I live in... Hudson Valley. I'm from New York originally, from Brooklyn. And really, as bad as it is in New York City at times, there is nothing like being in New York City for the holidays. Nothing. There's nothing like it. At at least for me. And I've lived in other places. And New York City is always kind of number one when it comes to when it comes to that. So, I'm ready. I'm ready for to get into full. I'm looking forward to that week, especially. So, you know, before I wanted to talk about the Game Awards and my year in review and what I'm playing, I did want to take a quick, let's see how long this goes, and talk about some of the reaction to the Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer that came out last week. Because, (laughs) oh man, I was thinking about this earlier and I was thinking about how to frame this and it might give you some insight into, and I'm trying absolutely not to make this a political statement or political show in any way, but I think there is room for that discussion when it's associated with talking about either of these genres, either pro wrestling or video games. And I think this is appropriate to talk about because if you're a certain age like me, you've seen this play out before, especially with Grand Theft Auto. Because when that trailer went live and started making the rounds, and you know the numbers by now, it's been, you know, 100 million plus people that have watched that trailer by now and um of course that pissed off some people the way things were to depicted in that trailer pissed off some people and lo and behold it's the same portion of the political spectrum that was pissed off last time GTA came out and the time before that and I find it there's a lot of irony there because, boy, this is going to, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> There's a lot of irony there because people saw the trailer and people saw certain aspects of that trailer. I think it was necess- it was really the twerking. There's that one the part of the trailer where the chick is twerking on the car. And by the way, that actually did happen because, as you know by now, a lot of those things that were depicted in the trailer for GTA 6 actually fucking happened because GTA is a satire on life in this country. Get over it. Anyway, so you had people on the right, the conservative circuit, that were saying, oh, ban GTA. Children should have be playing this. Shouldn't be playing this game. And if you remember, I think it was GTA 4. Go look up Jack Thompson. Go look up Jack Thompson, who was this attorney that was basically trying to get GTA banned because of how violent it was. Here's the thing. There's a thing in this country called the First Amendment. (laughs) 
And the Supreme Court already ruled that video games were protected under the First Amendment. So I find it ironic, the irony, the irony in a section of the conservative right folks in America calling for the ban of something they don't like. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar? The right rails against these Antifa folks who are anti-First Amendment, which is crazy to me, but yet they don't want this game to be protected under the First Amendment. They want this game to be banned for what it depicts. Does anybody else not see the irony in that? And this is why I will say this to him blue in the face. Both sides are the same. They really are. They're really caricatures <laughs> of the problems in this country. And when you boil things down to it, they both stand for the same thing in many different ways. It's, it's their own spin on it, but they're two sides of the same coin. And this is a perfect example of that. The fact that you have people on the right running around saying the ban, ban GTA sounds very familiar to people on the left who want to ban certain words or ban comedians from uh, insulting or joking around about certain segments of the population or want to cancel somebody over that stuff. The same thing. It's the same fucking thing. So to sit there and to say you want to ban a video game because children shouldn't be playing the game. The people who are going about around saying that stuff, they're probably not going to let their kids play that game. There are parental controls on the consoles. You should be having a say in what your kids are watching and playing. I believe I truly believe that. I always said if I had a kid, I would have never let them watch the Attitude Era. No, no fucking chance. When you think back at it, no way. My brother was watching it. <laughs> but that was a decision that my mother made. That she was okay with letting him watch that stuff. So yeah, I have no problem taking control over what your children are, are playing or watching or, or, or doing. But this game is going to be played by so many different demographics. It's a fucking adult or it's a mature rated game. So of course they're going to be mature themes in the game. Why should that be banned? That doesn't make any sense to me. Again, two sides of the same coin, the right and the left. They really are. This whole idea that People want to ban something because they don't like it is fucking bullshit. And I'm going to call people out on it when it happens. Because it's not right. It's not like GTA 6 is fucking hurting anybody. It's not like a drag show is hurting anybody. You don't want to have kids there? Okay. I can, I can somewhat buy that argument. In some ways. Well you shouldn't ban the shows. Because adults get a kick out of it. I get a kick out of it. It's fun. It's a good time. You want to ban kids from it? Okay. But you don't want to ban the shows themselves. You don't want to ban GTA 6. Something that's protected under the First Amendment. The same way those drag shows are. Freedom of expression. In this country. That is one of the few things that's make this, that makes this place great. And the thing is too. Is that that game. It's already showing. It is going to fucking lambast. Both sides of the aisle. Somebody had pointed out. With the video. I didn't go back and, and watch it. But I, I trust them. Because they are very high profile podcaster. In, this, in the video game space. And there's a billboard. That's essentially making fun of medication for mental health. 
So they're going to go there. And that's going to piss off people on the left. And they're going to piss off people on the right. You don't think there's not going to be a Trump reference or references in GTA 6? <laughs> Come on. The fucking thing's based in Florida where Trump spent a lot of time during his presidency. It's open season, man. It's open season on both sides. And I'm like I said last week, I am here for it. It's going to be fucking great. And I can't wait. I cannot wait to see how upset that this game is going to get people. It's going to be great. <laughs> I can't wait for it. And maybe, maybe that serves as a wake-up call in a way. Because you're going to have this very popular game pissing off people on both sides. It's going to be awesome. Anyway, so moving on here. And talking about the Game Awards, which was not shown at. GTA was not shown there. Oh boy, there. I'm not going to spend too much time on this and, and kind of rehash what a lot of people have already said about, about the Game Awards. But the format's broken. It's not fair that these developers were getting played off the stage. Even though Jeff Keighley, as you may or may not know, he's the organizer of, of this thing. He's a long time kind of figure in the video game industry and started doing... He bought the Game Awards from Spike TV, uh, you know, a long time ago. I think it was 10, 11 years ago. And it's turned it into this yearly kind of extravaganza that combines awards and combines lots of trailers. And we got both of those last Thursday. By the way, three and a half fucking hours I sat there and watched that show. Oh my God. Oh, I want to freaking poke my fucking eyes out sitting there. I was sitting in this office, in this chair, the one that I'm talking in right now, watching that show. Oh, God. And they screwed you, man. They got you in there at 7.30 Eastern to watch this stupid 30-minute pre-show, which was fucking awful. Who was writing this stuff, by the way? Who was writing this stuff for that woman? I feel I felt bad for that woman. I forget what her name is. It doesn't matter. The shit was awful. The dialogue was just fucking awful. It was awful all night. It really was. And then, and then you get into the show, and right away... I mean, it was right away, man. I said, oh, shit, this is, we're in trouble. <laughs> this is not going well already. Because what happens? They come out and they give the award for best performance in a video game. Right? And the guy from uh, God of War was the the guy presenting the award. And he made a joke that got people upset. It's like, ah, who cares? It Shit happens at the Oscars all the time. They joke about stuff. Made the, he made the joke about, you know, the Call of Duty campaign being really short. I didn't really have a problem with it, you know? I, I really did it as I put my glasses down and scratched my eyes. But, you know, he went on too long with his spiel, with the award. And then the guy who plays the main character in Baldur's Gate 3, which kicked ass, by the way, Thursday night. And now it's available on Xbox, finally. Not sure. I want to play it. It's going to happen at some point, but I need to get through a few things first. So the guy comes up there and gives this very impassioned... The dude was in tears. I mean, the guy was practically in tears. And gives this very heartfelt, impassionate, you know, passionate speech. Accepting the award. Uh, you know, talks about, I believe the gentleman is gay. Don't, don't quote me on that. But, you know, talks about how a lot of people reached out to him and felt like they were seen, you know, and cause you don't really get a lot of like characters, gay characters or, or whatever in that way. in in a major video game, at least that's the assumption that I'm making. And it was very heartfelt, whether you agree with him or not, it was a heartfelt speech. And then they're fucking playing him off the stage. 
Apparently, they only had 30 seconds. Like, that was a pro. I was like, when that was happening, I was like, oh, man, this is bad. This is really bad. And that was kind of, that set the tone for the night, really, with the complaints about the awards, about how the T, the, the Game Awards is trying to be too Hollywood and not focusing on the developers that we are supposedly supposed to be celebrating. Instead, listen, I didn't necessarily have a problem with Matthew McConaughey being there because he's going to be in that game that, that got announced, The Exodus. I didn't mind Anthony Mackie being there because, hello, he's in the Twisted Metal TV show. That's cool. I didn't necessarily mind that. But then they brought out the cast for Fallout 4. I mean, the Fallout TV show on an Amazon. I don't know. I just think a lot of this stuff too, took too long. And then the whole thing with Hideo Kojima. My God. Like, come on, man. You know, that, that a lot of that time could have been given back to the developers when they were giving their speeches. And then when you had the Larian folks, when they won Game of the Year, come up and, again, being played off the stage when they were trying to, you know, remember the people that died of, of I'm assuming, COVID when they were developing the game. And they had to cut that short. Just really bad. Really bad optics. People were complaining about it on Twitter all night. Jeff, as, as at least, addressed, addressed that publicly last week, that that's going to change going forward because it, it needs to but I mean man three and a half hours of watching that shit and was I blown away by anything like I don't, the whole thing with Blade is cool right and that that has been engulfed in controversy as well because we don't necessarily know if it's going to be an exclusive because it didn't necessarily say that in the little in the little trailer so that was kind of controversial. The same thing goes for OD, which is Hideo Kojima's, you know, cloud-based game that he's trying to get out there. I'm assuming this stuff is going to be exclusive to Xbox. I don't understand why it wouldn't be. That's kind of silly. But then we got the Hellblade thing, and that left a bad taste in people's mouths because we don't have a date yet. I'm going to assume that Xbox is going to do another another Developer Direct in January next month. So maybe we'll finally get a date there. But I don't know. Then you have the God of War DLC, which, eh, I don't know. It's fine. I, do, I am going to give it a try. I might give it a try tonight after I'm done here. But, uh... But yeah, I don't know. I don't think anything really blew me away. I did. I was like, holy shit for Blade. I think that's really fucking cool. And finally, hopefully, Xbox has a superhero game. Blade is 50 years old, man. It's been around since 1973. I'm only five years younger than Blade, which is crazy. Six years, I'm sorry. I was born in 79. So... So yeah, that's the that's the game awards. I mean, I again I don't wanna I'm not gonna like belabor the point about the problems with that with that show, but man, to sit there for three and a half hours and, and watch that thing was it was uh it was kind of torture in a way. So I'm gonna talk quickly about what I have been playing because I finally finished Alan Wake Remastered. And if you saw it on Twitter, I got to the end there. I finished the game and I'm like, what the fuck just happened? And it wasn't until I saw my brother and spoke to him about it that he told me basically what the twist was. And here's the thing. I'm going to spoil it a little bit here. If you're playing Alan Wake 2, you already know the spoiler for Alan Wake 1, for Alan Wake Remastered. So, I am going to spoil it right now in 3, 2, 1. You've been warned. Basically, Alan Wake switches places with his wife. So, he's in the dark place right now. He wrote himself 
into the dark place. So that's it. That's the spoiler. <laughs> and I will make a note of that uh in the um in the in the timestamps here that it is a, a mild spoiler for the first two two three seconds here. Minutes, I should say. Sorry. Um, but yeah, you know, listen, I I had some problems with the game, you know. I did not like the combat at all. It's just, I just, I hate, and I mentioned this last week, I hate when I feel like I am really fighting with the controller. I felt like I was fighting with the controller to do the dodge movement, which you had to tap the the left button for that. I felt like I was, even if you shot these guys in the head, it didn't fucking matter, which doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I mean, I guess it does make sense because they're fucking shadows. Uh, the flashbangs are the best weapon because it's basically an instant kill anytime those flashbangs explode. I thought that they did a pretty good job of keeping you armed for the most part. There were a couple of areas where it was like, oh, what the fuck is happening here? Like, I don't have enough bullets to get through this, through this, um, through this section, but Sometimes you got to like, almost like force it in there. That's what she said. Almost got to force it in there. And, you know, to be able to pass through, to pass through a level. As far as the level design, I mean, it was fine. I didn't have a problem with the way it kind of felt like it was open world a little bit because you were able to kind of go, you know, do some exploring along the linear path. And that was how you found the the pages to the manuscript, which I thought was cool. I, I, I love that aspect of Alan Wake as me, the former writer. And when you throw in this, I should say the former journalist, when you throw in this writing aspect to Alan Wake, he's a novelist, right? Famous novelist in this universe. And you're going around looking for these missing manuscript pages that basically predict things that are going to happen in the game. I obviously did not find all of it, all of them. And, you know, at the end, you can see the stats and like, wow, I missed a lot. There's some shit that I missed in that game. I'll tell you that right now. Apparently, there were these, like these, uh, you know, you know the carnival game where they set up the little bottles and you have to knock them down with the, with the, like a baseball. Apparently, that was a thing there. I only like knocked down one or two that I found I missed some of the TV aspects because, you know, they have that, like, live TV aspect of of these Remedy games. So I missed that. Apparently, there were pieces of a video game that were supposed to be found that I never found. You can go back and replay those chapters, and I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to do that. I did download the American Nightmare DLC, and apparently that's only three to four hours, so... I'm definitely going to aim to knock that out ASAP, but but yeah, you know, listen, I'm going to play Alan Wake 2. Obviously, I'm going to play Alan Wake 2. There's not even a question about me playing that game, and I'm really looking forward to, to jumping into that at some point. Um, Firewatch, I am almost done with it. I think I played a little bit this morning before work started. I think I'm in the last day. That, that you're there. Um, listen, it's been it's been cool. I, I the only the only I would say complaint about the game is just the navigation and the fact that I think towards the end I was heavily relying on the map to get around to get around on the paths because it can be a little bit confusing. And you get you can get turned around, at least I did, rather easily. And just as far as like the mystery involved with the story, I'm still not sure. I feel like there's something coming in this last day that I'm gonna find out. Uh there was a big reveal this morning that was like, oh shit, that made me say holy shit out loud. When I say holy shit out loud when I am playing a game, that means it really had an impact on me and there was a holy shit moment in this game so i'll leave it at that 
for for you know if you haven't played it to find it. I say play it, man. Especially if it's, if you're on Game Pass, it's like six or seven hour game. I think I'm 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 like I said I'm near the end of it, and um, yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to. There's another game out there that is very similar to uh, Firewatch, and it's been described as like Firewatch in space. And let me let me uh, look for it. Uh, because I think uh, The Invincible yes it's been described as The Invincible is like Firewatch in space so I I definitely want to play that to play this game uh, it came out recently, and I think it's gotten pretty decent, uh, decent reviews. Uh, let me see, the Invincible. Metacritic. It's got a nine out of ten rating on Steam, so that's pretty fucking good. That's really good, actually. Uh, Let's see what the Metacritic is. Metacritic is... Whoa. It has a 70... Wow, that's interesting. It's got a 71 on Metacritic, but uh, its user score is 8.3. So, I don't know, man. Sometimes you gotta, like... It's... (laughs) You know what's funny? Uh, it's got a higher Metacritic score on Xbox. 74 on Xbox, 71 on PC, and 70 on PS5. That's oh, that's interesting to me. But the user reviews on Metacritic are generally favorable. And it's got a 9 out of 10 on Steam. I don't know. I would take those Steam numbers uh, as like your best bet there. Anyway, so looking forward to that. So... I want to end the podcast by talking a little bit about my gaming year in review. And if you're unaware, and I think this is the first year that Xbox has done this, there's always kind of been a way to get around this with like other websites that track this stuff. But Xbox finally got a board on something that that um, PlayStation has been uh, has been doing doing for years, uh, past few years. They have this like year in review thing, which is cool. It's cool to kind of see, you know, where you stack up. And I like some of the, st- I, I think, I actually think that Microsoft slash Xbox provided better stats than, uh, of course, I forget my, uh, my uh, timestamp here, but <laughs> so it's a little off. So here, overall, Let's get into some of the nitty gritty here. I I counted it up and added it out. 398 hours of total time playing video games this year. And we still have two weeks left. So I'm definitely going to go over 400 hours combined between the two platforms. And I mean, when you do the math on that, it really isn't a lot. You know, let's see. Let's just do, let's just say I'm going to hit 425 hours this year, right? Uh, Let's do the math here. I mean, you're really only averaging, (laughs) you're averaging about an hour, uh, 1.1 hours of gameplay every day. Well, of course, you know, you're you're playing you're playing your games in 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 bunches, but anyway. So, let's um let's see, where should I start cuz I got both of them up here. Let's do a PlayStation, PlayStation first. And the funny thing is that they don't give you a total here, but I think uh, with both the platforms it was pretty even actually. 200 hours on PlayStation and 200 hours on Xbox. And so my big hitters, my top five games on PlayStation were Hogwarts, 
with 75 hours. Holy shit. Marvel with Spider-Man 2. I don't even know why I said Marvel. 39 hours. God of War Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Excuse me. 35 hours. Evil West 19. And the reason why it's 19 is because I've started that game two different times. And I'm about to start it again a third time. And fucking finally get through that damn thing. And then I went back and was starting to play my Marvel, uh, you know, Spider-Man remastered. Because I was trying to get a feel for the mechanics again for for Spider-Man 2. But clearly spent a lot of time playing Hogwarts Legacy. I bought it for PlayStation because of the early access. And honestly, PlayStation makes it so easy to buy a game in the app. That I was on my way back from work and I was like, fuck, I really want to play this because it's out now. And I bought the early access thing and I started playing it on PlayStation 5. So that's that. I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, my gaming style is Thrill Seeker. I don't know, whatever the fuck that means. Stupid. Game in a month in January was God of War, uh, was Ragnarok. February was... Uh oh, this is interesting how that has the gaming the gaming sessions. Like how many times I played, I sat, uh, I played. Um interesting. So February uh Hogwarts, March was Hogwarts, April into Hogwarts. so I basically was playing that game for three fucking months. And I was thoroughly playing that game. Like really playing that game. So May was Evil West. I was trying to get back into that. You know what the funny thing is? I didn't play my PlayStation in August and September. You know why? Because I was playing Starfield. <laughs> and I'll get into that. Then go back into October and into November. Guess what I was playing? Spider-Man. And I haven't really touched my PlayStation in December. So the funny thing is that I've been playing uh, Everybody's Golf as well. But that didn't even come up here. You know what the slick thing is about that is because they give you a playlist for thrill seekers, right? And they, they're almost encouraging you to sign up for PlayStation Extra and PlayStation Premium. So here are the games that they that they um, suggest, which is they're not really good, except for Far Cry 6. Dark Pictures Anthology said Far Cry 6. Demon Souls, which, oh, some more came up here. I'm sorry. Demon Souls, not really a Souls fan. Horizon Forbidden West, that was my top game last year. Dragon Quest Heroes, weird. Sniper Elite 5, weird. Let's see, this next thing here. Yeah, so this year I played for 177 hours on my PlayStation 5. I spent 99% of my game time playing only 5 games, which is kind of fucking crazy. And then... Let's see. I'm going through this. Earned 83 trophies. Still don't have a fucking platinum. (laughs) Which is not surprising. Uh, I'm just going through this here. They're looking at my PlayStation Stars. And I can redeem for this like spider bot thing. Uh, Avatar and PlayStation Stars Digital Collectible Unlocked. And then they have an advertisement for Helldivers 2. Rise of the Ronin. So they're giving me a preview of stuff that's coming out like next year. Which is interesting. So anyway, so that's the that's on the PlayStation side. So the Xbox side. 212 hours gaming. Over a total of 20 games, which I was like, I was very fascinated by that that was, I played that many games on uh, on Xbox. I played more, obviously, games on Xbox than I did on PS5. So 25 games overall. But it's a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit misleading because a lot of games I just kind of checked in on and dipped out on right away. Like Atomic Heart, fucking hated that game. Not good at all. Never finished High Five Rush. I need to get back to that. I'm just this list of scrolling lies. A P I messed around with a little bit. I would like to get into that. Bolt Gun. Played a little bit of that. 
uh, messed around with Battlefield a little bit. Obviously, the show messed around with it. With it. Uh, downloaded again Modern Warfare 2 because of the servers were back up. So, okay. I thought this was interesting. I was in the top 20% of players for hours played. I was in the top 10% of players for gamer score. And I was in the top 10% of players for achievements unlocked, which I thought was really interesting. So it's kind of funny because as somebody who, you know, works 45, 50 hours a week, you know, you kind of try to get your gaming in here and there, but you look at those numbers, I, I've, I'm i playing more than I thought I was, which I think is pretty cool. So most played game, Starfield, 79 hours. And that puts me in the top 20% of this game's most active players. Here's the funny shit. You ready for this one? My second most played game <laughs> was Gotham Knights. 43 hours in Gotham Knights. That put me in the top 5% of this game's most active players. That's crazy. Listen... Low-key, Gotham Knights was like my dark horse of the year. As much as I love playing Starfield, as much as I love playing Spider-Man, as much as I love playing Harry Potter and God of War Ragnarok, Gotham Knights got a bad rep. It got low scores. But once you get into that gameplay loop, it's really a hard, it's really a hard game to put down. And I thought it had a decent enough story. My problem with Gotham Knights was the fucking dialogue was so fucking cringe it was that marvel-esque dialogue that was what the problem was with gotham knights so not surprised 43 hours and then number three i finally 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 got through star wars jedi fallen order that was for 33 hours and that put me in the top five percent of this game's most active players so there you have it with my 2023, it's not over yet, obviously. We still have another two weeks, and I plan to play as much as possible in those two weeks. So, listen, thanks again for taking this time. This is the longest episode that I've done. Uh, obviously, there was a lot to talk about this week between both genres and, uh, again, Follow me on all the socials. I'm on X. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. I'm on TikTok. I'm going to have those links in the description of the podcast to make it easier. And uh, yeah, leave a comment on to, on YouTube. Give me a subscription, man. I need those subscriptions. I need to get to 500 subscriptions. I don't know how that's going to happen, but we'll see. I also just, just started a Facebook page, so... Uh, Again, I'm going to put as much of this as I can in the description and, you know, get the links out there and uh, go from there. I thank you for the people who are listening, for joining me uh, this week, and hopefully uh, we'll have another great show next week. Take care then. Bye-bye.